engage, disrupt, adapt, repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious leaders, innovators, and people who are ready for the next level and beyond. Wow, I'm really excited today to be able to speak to Will Carlson, the owner of Willpower Consulting. One of the really exciting opportunities in talking to Will is the fact that he has such a deep uh, experience level in associations. Will was raised in the association world, he's worked in the association world, and now he's using that knowledge to help associations on their reinvention strategies. Thanks, Will, for being here. Oh, real pleasure, Mike. I'm happy to be here. Will, can you give the, for the individuals who are, who are listening to us today, can you give them some of the background you have specific to associations that will help them understand um, some of the rest of our conversation today? Well, I'd love to. Um, I, I grew up in a trade association. My, uh, my folks, uh, my father was a PhD in horticulture and uh, uh, saw a need in the uh, um, greenhouse uh, crop and soil science industry, a bedding plant industry, to find an association in the late 1960s. And my mom became uh, the uh, office manager, and my brother and I were the first employees and actually stuffed envelopes. And I went off to college thinking I'm never going to be in associations because uh, I'm never gonna, I don't want to stuff envelopes. Um, but uh, I ended up uh, getting a degree and uh, had interest in uh, government affairs and ended up back in the association business and uh, started with uh, cut flower growers in the early 1990s. And then um, we had a promotional order, uh, which that evolved into. Um, and then I uh, worked um, with uh, Select Registry, a group of uh, um, uh, innkeepers. And uh, so it's just been just this continual evolution for about 20 some years of uh, working with uh, boards and working with uh, associations, it's small business associations and the trade associations. Yeah. So, so, Will, as you have looked at the last 20 years of associations and as you have worked both in them and have had a strong opportunity to observe them, what has been some characteristics that you've noticed about associations that, that as we go forward are really key characteristics that we've got to understand and start to address? Well, I, I remember growing up and, you know, that new thing, that, that, that trade show was just a new exciting thing in the 70s and that, uh, you know, we had conferences and it was the vehicle for people in the same industry to really compare notes and learn together. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, like in the bedding plant industry with my folks, uh, it was... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people were in different crops, and they finally had built greenhouses, and they really didn't know what to do, and they tapped into the wealth of knowledge of the universities and each other, and together built themselves very viable um, economic businesses. And then, and that model was great when they were all learning, but then once they got it down, people, you know, the sons of the operation had didn't have the time. Um, it wasn't a family vacation opportunity anymore to go to conferences. Um, trade shows, uh, most of the businesses already had deals established with the vendors, and so they weren't, you know, vendors weren't making sales, and so the model you really start seeing in the 1990s, uh, that model, at least from my perspective in the industries I was working with, uh, it was starting to peter out. And then I had this big aha moment with Select Registry where uh, I'm, you know, trying to convince the son of a Hall of Fame member that you know we have our member benefits and you know give them the pitch that most of us do um, that we've learned over the years of all the great things that we do and the networking opportunities and the gentleman basically stops me mid sentence and says well I believe you but here's the proposition you're giving me that I have to pay X amount of money to get my foot in the door to work harder to get more benefits and you know he I did convince him to stay in that year but it was a huge revelation to me that, you know, this is a model, especially with the younger generation, that, uh, you know, the altruism and the instant gratification, there's a different equation going on here, and that we really have to focus on, you know, services and instant access to these services, and that's where we're, it's a huge problem that we really need to address immediately. What it sounds like you're beginning to address is there's this cultural shift that's going on that the members of today and certainly the members of the future um, will be interested in, in participating if there is value. That the, that the more obligatory value of, uh, of associations and trust us, it's, it's, it will be good for you to be a member, may not necessarily be working anymore and that we need to really look at what, what consumers or members will really purchase, what they really feel is valuable in terms of then defining 
the member benefit and the, and the member attraction into our associations going forward. Can you spend a little time and talk about how you've been able to discover and been able to verbalize this more consumption model of associations going forward as opposed to some of the more obligatory membership uh, expectations that we have had in the past? Sure. Uh, a few years ago in my journey, I, I, I did um, take a brief time and went off to um, start a small a company that helped uh, you know, build websites for small vendors and small associations. And I was really interested in the social media phenomenon. And I wanted to join an association. And I had a difficult time locating an association in that field. And I found that there were a couple private entities in like content marketing and in the social media world that were actually just producing tons of content, holding conferences, bringing in all the big names. And they, they, developed, they were basically implementing a content marketing model in which there was a ton of information that I found tremendously useful and that for a period of months I was using and consuming to the point where I had great value with that. And the next thing I know, I'm spending $500 uh, for one of their webinars, you know, a series of their webinars, and then I'm spending a few hundred dollars for, you know, getting the recordings of their conferences. And so essentially I become a member. And, uh, you know, that model to me really stuck, you know, because I, I, I'm like everybody else. I've got tons of time. I mean, I, I have time considerations. I have financial considerations. And I want to feel comfortable um, being able to part with that money and get real value immediately. And so that really convinced me that, you know, especially for most of or many associations, not all. I mean, there are, you know, many different types of associations. But I think those who really have a strong educational program and a strong knowledge-based program that a content marketing system yeah, would be uh, very vital moving forward. Now, when you say a content marketing um, um, opportunity, I, I think what you're really saying is instead of having member dues as the major revenue generator, what you're really saying is the content you are selling, whether it's education or opportunity or whatever that content and opportunity is, is, is um, something that you can put a dollar value to. It's something that you can economize and then it becomes more of a, uh, the dues become what the member consumes by choice as opposed to this number that we send them a bill for annually and then we expect that they will consume. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think it also being able to make a, a, a sizable portion of that available uh for free or some, you know, allow people to sample to get them at least into the uh, rabbit hole, if you would. Um, I, I think that that would be, you know, that's what we need to do is to provide, you know, and associations are uniquely situated because we are the gateway. We have, you know, the best practices, you know, we have the membership and the ability and the knowledge base within ourselves to really be a good filter uh, you know, as opposed to somebody going to Google immediately where you don't know where that information, the quality of that information. So I think we're uniquely positioned to pull such a model off and uh, sustain ourselves in the immediate, at least the immediate future. So if the key to success for any viable entity is to be unique in what it's offering is, you're saying that associations have a very unique opportunity because they have the content, because they have the trust, to be able to then commoditize that in a way that allows people to purchase and consume it as needed for the member to perceive, uh, to determine whatever value is important, and then almost let that activity drive the financial success of the association as opposed to the old dues model. Yes, I agree with that. And, and I think, though, it requires a two-way street in which uh, associations really have to be in tune in touch with their members and their member needs. And But uh, allowing the market forces to really dictate where you're going with that. Is so important. that does drive the fact that associations must maintain relevance, and that relevance is then determined by what members are purchasing from it. Yes. And so it does put a whole new set of expectations on the association to be relevant and be current in what its offerings are to its members, because if your offerings are old, members won't purchase those. In fact, I've heard many stories of associations who are now seeing competitors spring up because there are others that are recognizing that members have these needs that the association is not addressing. And these competitors are finding economic uh, niches where they can provide those services because associations are not. So it's building credibility 
on this very subject that you're talking about, that as an association or any business can stay close to its customers, it does allow for it to have relevant products. Now, I also want to make sure I understand you said, in some cases, we want to give some of that content away as a means to establish this member benefit. So not everything is for sale. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, content marketing, and it, it's a popular phrase, especially in the social media circles right now, but it's really an old concept. Uh, actually, um, modern-day content, content marketing goes back to the uh, John Deere Corporation. And uh, they, in the early 1900s, created a magazine um, just on successful farming practices. And it, that magazine still exists today. But it, it basically created a model in which, you know, they were a go-to resource. You know, and obviously, if you're a successful farmer, then you're going to buy equipment. Uh, you know, in the social media realms that I'm, I'm very attracted to, that folks are putting out great information to get you in the entryway, uh, you know, to learn the basics of social media. Then when you get a little more advanced, then you'd be able to purchase material that you can get more mileage out of. But, you know, especially in this modern day and modern era where things are very complex, you really have to educate people first and the value and then once you educate them well enough, they can effectively be informed consumers and then buy the right materials that they need to progress in their journey. Well, this is making a lot of sense because if, if you're telling me that one of the main functions of associations is education, if you're telling me one of the main opportunities that an associate, association has it is, is it has credibility with its membership to be providing accurate and useful information, then this is, a, this is an absolute perfect fit for associations looking to go forward, but I'm going to guess you're going to tell me there has to be some sort of structure in order for that content to be available to this to the membership. Agreed. And also one other thing I would like to add is that the, uh, we're seeing trends now, at least in the internet world, that people are getting overwhelmed with so much information that a filter is almost necessary and vital. And uh, associations can serve that function. But yeah, I think it has to be structured. We have to, you know, I'm working with MSAE and they just have this tremendous model that they call third thought and they structure it and they make a statement to everybody that uh, these are the skill sets you need to succeed as an association executive. And it's very clear and it's very well laid out and there are like a hundred subsections to it. And it, it by developing the structure, you are helping people to structure their education and structure their knowledge and their needs, as well as help you to diagnose what areas need fill, you know, need to be filled. And so it helps you from a content development point of view and, and it helps the uh, uh, member uh, to structure their education and the benefits in moving forward in their own personal and professional journeys. So in order to create that clarity, what you're suggesting is an association has to, first of all, have the credible information, which it has, but then organize it in a way that makes it easy for the member to follow uh, so that it has its usefulness to it and the member can digest it at the right pace. Absolutely. How does that re uh, So how does that restructuring that you're talking about with associations going forward have some parallel lessons? to the city of Detroit, which you and I have spent time in and will continue to spend a lot of time in, how do those two entities, associations in the city of Detroit, how, how are there some parallel lessons that we can be learning here? Wow. You know, I, just in the experience I've had with you going there and the, the, the excitement and the opportunity um, out of a very you know, tragic, in many cases, uh, uh, circumstance and the commitment and the drive by these folks to really get down to the bare bones and turn things around. I am so excited about that opportunity that Detroit has and how the Detroit CVB is really, the Convention's Visitors Bureau is really committed to highlighting that and making available to association directors across the country uh, a, a laboratory. You know, and I know when I was running my association and, you know, looking for conference venues, I was not interested necessarily in the local attractions. What You know, every, every place has them, and they're nice. But I'm interested in an overall, you know, I have a conference theme, and I want to 
really bring points across to my membership. And a very important point right now is this concept of reinvention that every industry is going through. And here you have Detroit as a tremendously wonderful lab and where you're seeing, you know, shining examples all across. And to plug the association community into that is just a very exciting concept to me. It, it is a very exciting concept. And it's a, it's a very unique opportunity, as you talked about, unique opportunities to grow um, a business going forward. And that is... The story of Detroit, much like the story of association, starts with getting back to its core root understandings. And it's been very interesting to listen to you talk about how associations uh, need to go back to their core roots and, and that basic understanding. It's the same with the city of Detroit, which I would suggest is the same with any uh, entity as it looks to reinvent itself, is to identify what is unique and special about it that it can build going forward. And you're right, it is a learning laboratory where every day it has something new going on that can teach us exactly what lessons this, that the city is learning that we can apply within the association world. And it creates a very unique venue for meeting planners and association executives to look at that and say, wow, nowhere else on this planet do we have an opportunity to learn like we do uh, in this kind of this parallel thought process between the city of Detroit as it's going through its reinvention process and the association world, which is, which is doing the same uh, exact thing. I want to spend a little bit more time, Will, with you talking about this, uh, this core unique opportunity with associations and education and how associations need to really think about utilizing um, the, the filter and the brand that they have and then using education as a primary tool for attracting new members into the association going forward, because I think most of our associations are starting to, to feel the effect of flat or declining members and dollars, and they're, we're looking for how do we attract these new members in. And I think one of the things that you talked about was, one, education, and two, the opportunity to network with your peers uh, that become key in how we reinvent those focuses going forward to be key attractors to our associations. Yeah, I, I think, you know, going back 20, 30 years, you know, you get your degree in college and be able to take those general skills and be able to make a career out of it. I think you find more and more we have to constantly um, undergo professional development and then willing to learn and constantly learn to stay ahead or at least be familiar with the trends so you can make good informed decisions. There is a lot of information out there. You know, this is just a golden age of information. The problem is, and I'm, you know, as guilty as anybody, you can just get overwhelmed. And, you know, Google out there is a wonderful resource, but for any particular search term, you have about 2 million possible responses. What is good? I mean, my wife's a teacher. She had a kid do a report on the existence of dragons, thinking the dragons are completely real entities because the Internet says so, you know. And so we, we need filters. We need the ability, and, and the trade associations have that ability because they have the cream of the crop in any particular industry, and we can basically together as an association and collaboratively establish the set of, these are the knowledge, this is the set of knowledge that you need to succeed in our industry. And we can even go beyond that, you know, for maybe manufacturing and other industries where, you know, we need labor to come in and we need to basically develop the skill sets. Uh, you know, we're finding that the colleges and the technical schools, there's a kind of a disconnect we're kind of seeing on the grassroots level. And I think associations are uniquely positioned to be able to go in and do that. But it does, as you were saying, we have to come in with comprehensive um, curriculum. We have to come in with comprehensive uh, uh, statements as well as an outline of these are the skill sets and then build your and utilize, you know, what you're producing in your magazines and in your conferences and all that material, you need to leverage and have a plan with that, not just a simple ad hoc, oh, we need a speaker here. Let's do it to fill in the knowledge base where we have known holes. And if you can come together a comprehensive plan like that, I think you're well in the way of developing the curriculums we need to keep our people current and, you know, instituting best practices. One of the real key buzzwords is lately has been this, this word called relevance. And um, I heard you say, instead of just filling holes, we need to make sure we're, we're identifying valuable content for our members to be able to have and consume. 
We worked with an association recently who was able to identify kind of the core key reason a member may find value in the association. And it was really very basic, but very intriguing in its, in its simplicity. And that was that one, you had to help the member either make money, you, he did, had to help the member solve problems, or three, you had to help the member manage change. How do you see, with those kind of three key basic points, how education and uh, the relevancy of education fitting into associations going forward? Well, I think it's uh, identifying best practices and emulating best practices and coming up with a, or you're basically imparting that into an educational curriculum and platform. And, uh, and you're exactly right. It's not knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It's got to be knowledge that helps you make money to stay in business. And, you know, and I, we often run into that quandary in association world where we want to be everything to everybody. And it's like, uh, no, you've got to invest to basically help that critical mass to get to the promised land and stay viable. And so you often have these tough decision points where, you know, you, you can't go catering near your lowest common denominator. You basically have to come up with a, a system that, you know, you get that typical, you know, at least member that's willing to learn and help them go and maintain their relevancy. Well, this is a fascinating conversation because this topic can go on forever. Mm -hmm. and, and the nice thing about associations and their role in education is that since it's constantly changing and the needs of the member is constantly changing, the opportunity to constantly have relevant content in front of the members for them to find useful is a huge opportunity for associations going forward. I just want to make sure that we, in wrapping up this conversation, that I understand some of the key points that you talked about. You started out saying that a number of years ago, trade associations were the place where there was a lot of networking and collaboration that took place, but then we started to see a decline in that activity. I believe you're going to tell me there are new ways that members want to network and collaborate. And so the networking and collaboration opportunity is still there. It just may be that we have to do it in very, very different ways. Because it seems like one of the number one things that mem future members are looking for are networking and collaboration opportunities. I'm, I'm really intrigued by your thought process behind the model of, of uh, consumption economics versus dues economics that that, that we've somehow imparted through our past practices that we could just kind of put a, a fee for dues as the primary reason that people would want to participate. And what you're really beginning to advocate is, is breaking down dues into more of a consumption thought process to see what people are really interested in buying. In that way, um, the consumables that an association has, which has an economic impact, actually becomes the bottom line number as a financial contribution to the association as opposed to the dues line at the top. And it's a fascinating model to think about. How do we move away from or how do we have a combination of dues and consumables that allows us to really, as a business, focus on what's relevant for the association as opposed to uh, getting stuck in perhaps having some old content that maybe isn't as useful to our members going forward. I appreciate you mentioning the city of Detroit and its opportunity to use as a learning lab because I do believe you're right that meeting planners and others will find a very unique opportunity to go into that space, be able to find people who are living in that space, who understand that space, and who are absolutely committed to the success of that space, and that it's a it's a, a absolute parallel journey that associations are also going through. Finally, I am with you 100% in that relevant education, current education, or future education is absolutely what's going to attract uh, the core of your membership to your business. Uh, yes, you'll solve problems. Yes, you will help them make money. But if your content is helping them stay, helping your members stay relevant and successful going forward, you'll be an association that stays in business for a long time. Yeah, I believe so, yes. Will, thank you very much for your participation today. It's an absolute pleasure to spend time with you. Me too. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new episodes are available by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.